So here we are, folks. Welcome, welcome to our uh, friends in the Streamline Business Strategies group. Thanks for popping on over for this live. Or if you are watching on YouTube or listening on the, what did you call it, Alyssa? The reboot. I don't even remember now. I just said it five minutes ago. Oh, the, the inaugural reboot. The inaugural reboot of the Small Biz 101 podcast, the pod faded uh, a few years ago, but I am so happy to have it back because um, I'm really excited about this series of bringing different experts in here for different aspects of small business, people who help small businesses. And I thought, what a great way to start is with the legal aspects related to business. So I'm really excited to have you both here. So yes, come on in. I see so we've already got some people saying hello. Please do as you come in. Thonda, so good to see you. Karina Langworthy, hello. Karen Sharp Price, so good to have you all on the call. Uh, stick with us if you have questions or if you want to share maybe some of the some of the legal issues maybe that you've been, well, nobody's going to want to share a legal issue, but, you know, if you've used an, an attorney in your business in a really effective way, great to hear more about it. Hello, Tabitha. Yeah, come on in. So I am, I'm Connie Whitesell, the owner of Scattered to Streamline Business Coaching. And I am thrilled to be here today with two of my favorite attorneys in the whole wide world. Um, I rely on them for many questions for my small business owner clients. And I ask them to join me today to share some of their expertise with you. For those who are watching us live in the group, uh, please continue to hop on. Let us know that you're here. Say hello. Share any questions that you may have. If you are, as I mentioned, if you are watching on YouTube or listening to the Small Biz 101 podcast, relaunching with this episode, uh, feel free to add your questions in the comments on YouTube or message any of us directly. I will be providing uh, contact information. And uh, Jennifer Culver has already con commented. She's already used, Alyssa, you for your trademark registration. Oh, that's fabulous. So you don't even have to be in the same state to do that. Jennifer's in Wisconsin and Alyssa is in New York. And that's such a great example of what we're going to be talking about here. We'll be discussing the significance of having an attorney when launching a business, growing a business, ending a business, and everything that comes in between. So to begin, I want to introduce my guest today. Uh, we have uh, Alyssa Gross, who is an associate attorney with William C. Moran. Am I pronouncing that right? Yep. Moran and Associates PC, where Alyssa has practiced for six years. Uh, her practice focuses on corporate and nonprofit law advising both types of entities throughout their life cycle from startup through operation to transition or sale, including commercial real estate matters, employee issues, obtaining tax exempt status for nonprofits, and purchase and sale of business entities. Uh, I am also so happy to have Ruth P. George Esquire. Ruth is an estate planning and probate attorney with over 15 years of experience in trusts, estates, and real estate law. Uh, Ruth strives to find that extra way to help clients better prepare for the future. So she cares about protecting individuals from making mistakes ensuring their assets are handled properly and proactively planning to better the lives of the people that they love. So thank you both so much for joining me today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having us. My pleasure. My pleasure to you both, uh, for you both. All right, so let's kick this off just in uh, just a general question. Um, Alyssa, I'll direct this to you first, and Ruth, um, I'd, I'd like to ask you as well, but just an initial thought when we think about legal considerations in business, why does someone need to use an attorney, like say to start a business or advise them on business operations when there are a lot of internet sources that we see out there and other perhaps 
so-called business professionals or legal experts who are not attorneys? What, what is it about having an attorney that really makes a difference? I find that the older I get, the less the less tact I have. And I told somebody <laughs> last week that you could probably find a YouTube video on how to pull out your own tooth if it was bad, but that doesn't mean that you should. So that that to me is why you should have an attorney. Um, you can do a lot of things on YouTube, right? You can go on YouTube and find how-to videos on just about everything. Um, I think especially in New York, people are not necessarily aware of some of the nuances of New York state law. And so I find I get a lot of clients that are in a particular industry where they have contacts nationally in that same industry. And so it makes sense to them to go to those people to get advice on different aspects of their business. Sometimes I think that's a great thing to do, but the problem with doing that in terms of your legal formation and making legal decisions is if you're getting advice from somebody who's not in New York state, you're probably not getting good advice because there are so many things in New York that are just weird. They're different from how they're done other places. Um, we have procedures that are different. We have laws that are different. We have considerations that are different if you're employing people. Um, so pretty much everything in the process start to finish is different. I think the other value that having an attorney brings, and this is true pretty much no matter what kind of attorney you're engaging or for what type of matter, is that we are not invested emotionally in what's going on. So there's something to be said for having kind of a disinterested third party. That's not to say I don't care. That's to say that I do not have a personal investment in somebody's situation which a lot of times, especially in business, I think people get so emotionally entangled in what's going on or a conflict that they're having or a decision they're trying to make that it's really hard for them to take a step back and really look objectively at the situation. And sometimes having that completely disinterested third party, it's not your spouse, it's not your business partner, you know, it's not somebody else in the industry. It's somebody that's just kind of outside looking in that can really give objective advice and I think that's a I think that's a big thing that people don't necessarily think about unless they've had that kind of a relationship with an attorney and they've seen the value in it. That makes perfect sense. Um, Ruth, would you like to add to that? Yeah, so things can go wrong is the reason why you want to get an attorney on board as soon as you start thinking of starting a business because it's going to be another baby, <laughs> but a business baby. And you need somebody to think through things with you. Even if you're starting off as a DBA, you want to think about insurances in place and then moving into another kind of entity formation, which would be for liability protection purposes. And estate planning concepts are constantly weaving in and out of everything that you do. So for example, if you don't do something estate planning wise, then all you have is a DBA. Well, how is that DBA then passing through your estate when you pass? If you're just simply doing a will, then what does it look like there? What if you don't have a will and your estate is being split between a surviving spouse and minor children? And then you have a guardian at litem appointment through surrogate's court who's gonna wonder how are we handling this business interest? And by the way, what's going on with the business? There's so much to be said about getting an attorney involved who can help you start smarting these ideas out and bringing you forward in the process. You might be kind of naive, not really sure what you wanna do, but you'll certainly move forward in a better direction with that solid backing behind you. And I have to say that if you get an attorney you feel comfortable with and you can have the back and forth, you could literally save yourself thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. I am the perfect example. I didn't use an attorney and I, decided to get involved in a business with a friend, friend, an outright disaster. And there's a backstory and I don't want to get into it now, but I know how important it is to have a relationship. You want to get a document. I have plenty of files where somebody just got a document. They get a document. It's, it's a mess. There's no estate planning concepts that were built throughout the planning as well as all the, all the other disasters that we've got going on. And I could just list them for you. 
So it's amazing, I think, for Alyssa and I to see what happens when people really just think they're doing something quick and easy, but it's really causing disasters at the end of the day. Uh, thank you both for giving such such thoughtful responses to that, because I just and I see it happening in you. You both have different areas that you tend to work more in, but I, I see people all of the time thinking, well, I can just set up my entity online using one of those online resources or or Ruth putting together an online will or doing some of the estate planning with forms that are right there. And you've just shared so many great reasons for not doing that. And I am imagine in a lot of cases, maybe in most cases, it, it ends up being more expensive for the person down the road. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking about this today and how I have so many examples. I know Alyssa does too. <laughs> yeah, we I was telling Ruth and I, Ruth and I talked a couple days ago about what we were going to talk about today. And I was telling her, I did a presentation recently where I did, you know, using an online resource to save money versus then what you'd have to pay me on top of that to finish the work that they don't do and to fix all the stuff that they did wrong and to unsubscribe you from all the things they subscribed you to that you didn't need. And it ends up being twice as much. So, you know, you save money in the short term, but you don't end up with a completely established entity. And again, those online resources are national resources. So they don't necessarily have the state specific language that's required. They're not following necessarily the, the right state specific process. Um, and I run into that a lot. I don't think I've ever had a client that established their entity using an online resource where I didn't have to do at least one thing to fix or complete the work. I don't think I've ever had one. Yeah. I wrote out, I wanted to get these out there, some ideas about estate planning as far as thinking about things that will be to your benefit, especially if you use attorneys. Can I say them? Just Absolutely. broad categories. So you're maximizing your personal profits. Important, right? You're minimizing taxes. Of course, we all want to do that. There's a lot that goes into that alone. Of course, accomplishing your goals. And those goals can change over time. But who do you want to benefit and how are they going to benefit and what do your documents say? There's so much to be said on that alone. You want to protect assets. So extremely important, especially with the litigation that we see and you never know when there could be a problem down the road. And what are you doing to protect your assets? Of course, you want to make transfers easier for the next in line. So how are you helping the people who you expect to either deal with the business to close it up? or they're, being, uh, they're receiving transfers uh, via will or trust or during life, um, how are you going to make it easier for them so they can take the business and run with it or do what's needed? And then you wanna make it clear as to how you're moving forward. So all of those are kind of big ideas that you really wanna give yourself the right opportunity to work through. And that's why the attorney is so important. And I think that, that those ideas will change over time but you've got to bring out those concepts and be willing to have a good person to talk to in regard to all of those. Um, it's really an opportunity that you need to give yourself the proper weight and not just throw it out as far as, you know, something just to think about at some point in, in time. You really have to be prepared to move along in your process of owning a business and the life cycle of the business and all of those aspects so that you give the next people the opportunities that, that you want. All right, I'm glad you brought that up. It I'd like to delve into that a little bit more, particularly about the estate planning aspect of it, because I think typically people think of personal estate planning. I, I think a lot of people don't even consider plan that kind of planning when it comes to a business. Right, so you have the crash course of, we have a business that in and of itself can have all sorts of troubles within the business. And then you have the other idea of estate planning, where if you don't take certain measures, both for during your life and upon your passing, you could have more disasters. So you put the two of them together, you have potential business disasters and potential estate planning disasters. And you, you know, you've got a whole slew of concerns so you've got to start to be able to coordinate the two and i was talking to Alyssa again and it always drives me crazy when i see people who one way or the other 
they come for just, um, you know, you, can you start an LLC or something, but they don't have their estate planning matters in order, or they come to me to do a will. And the last thing I actually even hear about is that they own an LLC um, or they have an interest in an LLC. And I just, I'm always surprised at how people don't tie the two in because of course, they're both affecting each other one way or the other. You're affecting yourself, you're affecting the people that you care about and your goals. And so you have to tie the two in. Your business is an asset or your business interests are an asset. And you have, unlike all the other assets you own, much more to consider, to think about and to plan for, or things are on that collision course and they're going to go wrong. Um, there's so much to be said during life as far as what your plans are, but of course, I think those do change over time, whether you're thinking about closing up shop at some point, transitioning the business to other people, and who are those people, and do you want to have some sort of control around who those people should be, and how does that look in all of your legal documents, and then again, how are, are you passing along any business that you still hold upon your passing? Um, there's a tie-in between trusts, wills, power of attorney documents, operating agreements, shareholder agreements, partnership agreements, and on and on. You've got to be able to tie them all in. I constantly see a mismatch between one or the other. I had one the other day. I, I can't even tell who owns what shares. And I'm asking the accountant, what did you do on the corporate returns? So people are just not tying the two in the way they need to. And I do have to say, I've come across situations where someone, let's say, has come to me for one or the other as far as planning goes, and they already have an attorney involved. And I'm shocked that that attorney hasn't said one way or the other how we tie this in to your overall planning. Um, and there's very important specific concepts as far as estate planning goes. Um, rights of first refusal, powers of appointments, transferring your interests if you're an assignee of business interests? Do you have voting rights, non-voting rights? How can you transfer your business? Is it lineal descendants? Is it anybody? Is there a buy-sell agreement? Who are the other people? There's just so many concepts that, um, again, we could go on and on about, but the whole idea is it's a golden opportunity and don't waste it. Thank you. Thank you so much. So much valuable information there. And I'd like to I'd like to look at this um, in a bit chronologically because you've brought up so many good considerations through the life of a business. But what I'd like to do is kind of back up a little bit and talk about just the, initially the formation, right? Ruth, you had talked about some issues with, um, you know, having the DBA and Alyssa, I know you do, uh, I know you both do this, but Alyssa, I know you focus a lot on structuring businesses early on. Would you share a little bit, just like the basics, right? Yes, I got the, yes. Got the cups ready. Yes. Red Solo cup it for us, will yeah, you please? So I think, I think one of the, it's not even necessarily a problem. I think one of the things that we've done is we've done a really good job of educating people that when you have a business that exists separate and apart from you, which is true and accurate and important. And that's why I have the cups because I show people that this is you and your stuff and this is your business and it's stuff. But when it comes to estate planning, people forget that you still own this cup. And so I've had people that come and we talk about, you know, maybe selling and they they forget that there's a whole estate plan that should be part of that because they're used to thinking about these as two separate things. So I am I am typically talking to people, like you said, sort of step one. So they're thinking about establishing a business or maybe they've already started doing something, but they want to kind of formalize what it is that they've been doing. And so we go through and we do an assessment of, you know, what entity type makes the most sense. I typically don't care, to be honest. So I usually am going to defer to a tax professional on that. Um, I try to stay in my lane. So I tell people like, I'm, I'm the person to advise you on just the legal stuff. But when it comes to tax stuff, when it comes to some of the other things that are involved in your business, I would much rather work with somebody that I know, like, and trust to advise you on that so that we can give you consistent advice. So whatever your tax person thinks makes sense, that's what we'll do in terms of an entity type, because the only thing I care about is that we end up with a separate entity to protect you from liability. But I've definitely found at a variety of places in the life cycle of the business that I have people that are coming to me to talk about 
you know, they're changing ownership. Maybe they're bringing on a partner. Uh, they're buying out a partner and they're just going to be operating the business themselves going forward. And it's like people think about some of these things in silos. So I met with a client a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's a, a couple that's getting ready to retire. They're, they're both professionals. They own a practice together and they have um, a daughter and son-in-law that work with them in this practice. And they're planning on selling essentially to the daughter and son-in-law. And so we had this exhaustive conversation about what that's going to look like and some different ways that we could structure that transaction. But along the way, I said, have you done any estate planning? And they both looked surprised that I was asking, like, because, well, no, we're here to talk about our business. But I said, this is part of your estate plan. This is probably the biggest asset you own. You know, it's either the practice or like your home, the, the biggest thing that you own and so if we're going to be making changes to the biggest thing that you own, have we talked to your estate planning attorney about this? And how does what you're asking me to do fit into that overall estate plan? Because again, from a legal standpoint, just as a business attorney, I don't care what your estate plan is, right? I'll just, I'll just help you sell the business to your daughter. It doesn't make any difference to me. But if that's not what your estate planning attorney had in mind when he or she set up the whole rest of your estate plan, it doesn't make any sense for me to be wandering down a rabbit hole and, and doing something else with the business if that's not consistent with your overall plan. But again, I think I think it's this, I think it's this thinking. I think it's people thinking, well, this is what estate planning is for. And then also I just have my business. And I think one of the problems is that people start thinking about succession planning or estate planning with respect to their business at the very, very end of their career. So, you know, I'm thinking about retiring in the next 12 months. Now I'm going to start thinking about what I'm going to do with my business. And the problem with that is it took most people a lot longer than 12 months to get really good at what they're doing. And so unless they have an employee, they have somebody from the younger generation in a family business who has worked alongside them for a long time and has really been kind of groomed to take over that that role and to buy out the business, right? Because this is an asset we want to sell. We're not just going to give it away. Unless they've done that pre-planning a few years ahead, they're not going to be ready to retire in time. And so again, I think one of the things I talk to people about, you know, maybe not day one, but if we're a few years into the business, even if they're in their 30s or their 40s and they're planning on working another couple of decades, it's like, let's start thinking now about what's your end game with this business. You know, do you want it to just be something that supports you and your family? And then you're going to, you know, fund your retirement, however you're going to fund it. And you'll just close up shop and walk away. Like, that's fine if that's what you want to do. Or do you have an employee that you've worked alongside or a partner who's younger, who you've worked alongside that you want to ultimately transition this to? Um, I had a really good conversation with a financial advisor today who I work really closely with about really the same thing. And I think one of the challenges that I have with attorneys sometimes is that we tend to work like this. <laughs> so it's like we have blinders on and we'll do whatever work you specifically asked us to do. But I think a lot of attorneys just don't ask enough questions, right? So people come to us because we're supposed to be the experts. They don't even know what information they're supposed to be telling us. So we have to really learn to ask the right questions. And that's part of the reason why I like working on a, a good team of people who I consistently work with. And so this advisor and I share a number of clients, but we were talking about um, two girls that we work with who have a partnership and they're talking about long-term planning. What happens if something happens to one of them? You know, it's like, I've got, I can put together an operating agreement and say what happens. One of them's going to have to buy the other one out or buy out their estate or whatever. But if we don't have money for that, that's worthless as a plan. And so what he's looking at on his side is how are we going to fund what it is that you want to do? So are we going to put life insurance in place? How are we actually going to fund what we've already put into an operating agreement? So again, I think working collaboratively, whether it's with multiple attorneys, whether it's with a financial advisor, whether it's with you know a banker or somebody else who's involved in some other aspect of the business, if we're all operating in silos, people are not getting the best advice. Oh, such a good point about working in teams and all of these different considerations. I mean, already, I feel like both of you have just dropped so many value bombs here for business owners to think of. 
Um, I want to just uh, take a quick second just to say hello to the others that are here live watching the group. We've got Brandon Hills, Larry Van Dusen, Sabrina. So good to have you all on here. Thank you for your comments. If anyone has questions or comments about legal considerations, please feel free to post those in the live. And I'd like to go back, uh, Alyssa, to one thing that you said you were talking about the protections that come with uh, setting up a legal structure for your business. Something that I hear quite a bit from people um, is, well, I have business insurance or I have e &O insurance. Why do I need to do that? Why do I need to? So why can't I just stay, uh, you know, putting this through being a DBA? And what what do you say to that? Yeah. So we, we call that belt and suspenders. So like you really, really want your pants to stay up. You wear a belt and a pair of suspenders, right? So you would combine what I do with what insurance provides. And I tell people like the best I'm going to be able to do for you in some cases is going to leave a gap. And the best insurance is going to be able to do for you in some cases is also going to leave a gap. And the goal is that we put them one on top of each other. So at the very least, in every place across the board, we have at least one layer of protection. In most places, we're going to have two. First of all, insurance is going to protect you, but there's a limit on insurance. And second of all, insurance has carve outs. And I think a lot of times people just buy insurance and they have no idea what's covered, what's not covered. They don't understand what their limits are. Everybody, of course, is shopping for price, not quality. Um, which again is why I partner with the, the person I do for insurance, because I know that he's not going to sell somebody st something that's going to leave them underinsured, that they're really going to have a clear understanding of what's covered, what's not, where the gaps are. And again, that's why you have, you know, the, the gaps that a legal entity might leave for you and a gap that an insurance policy is going to leave. You want them one on top of another. Um, the other thing is you don't, you don't want to be named in a lawsuit to begin with. Exactly. <laughs> that's that's the one thing I think people don't understand is like you can sue anybody at any time for anything. So insurance and having an entity doesn't protect you from being sued. It protects you from losing. And I think people miss that. Um, you know, you could you could name anyone you want in a lawsuit, and then those people have to one at a time extricate themselves from your lawsuit and that costs money, which is why we have insurance. But it's not like you're you're protected from even being named as a defendant, right? I remember doing an exercise in law school where they give you a fact pattern and you had to come up with a list of all the people and entities you would sue. And it was like, you got extra points for every additional person and defendant that you came up with. Like, oh, I came up with 10, I'm doing really well. And that's how it works, right? So you dig around and you try and find the person or the entity with the deepest pockets it's never going to protect you from being sued. It's going to protect you from losing. So that's why, again, I have, that's why I have my cups. So the DBA is just you by a different name. This is all your stuff that you keep in your bucket. This is your house, your car, your retirement, your bank accounts, everything you have. And you're exposing your business to your personal liabilities as well. So we don't usually think about that. We typically think about, I want to protect myself from my business, but you want to protect your business from yourself too. So you get into a bad car accident that's your fault and you exceed the limits on your insurance. If your business is you, that's what I'm coming after if I sue you. If your business is over here, that's insulated from this liability here. So it's not just it's not just protecting yourself from business related litigation. It's protecting your business from personal litigation, too. Yeah. Oh, such good points. And Ruth, I'm seeing you nodding over there. Is something in particular coming to your mind about this too? <laughs> that was awesome, Melissa. Yeah. No, I mean, it is true. And we all kind of just think, uh, can I get away with this? Is this enough? You know, like, yeah, let's be smart about things. Let's make good decisions. Let's not cheap out in certain areas, you know? So way to go, Alyssa. Yeah. <laughs> I, I usually, my benchmark is like, am I going to lay awake at night worrying about you? So yeah. if, if you're starting a little side hustle, it's a super low risk activity and you rent an apartment and you have an old car and not a lot of money in the bank and you want to start with a DBA, I'm probably not going to lay awake at night thinking about you and worrying about you. Frankly, you don't have a lot to lose, right? But if you are fairly well established in your career and you own a house and you're married and you have kids and you've got a solid retirement going, you've got money in the bank, 
and this is your full-time job, drop a thousand dollars and start an LLC. Like, give me a break. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, well, and the, all right. Now I'd like to shift just a little bit back into the, um, into the estate planning. So Ruth, you know, you, and I think you both have mentioned different aspects where people are waiting so long to, or waiting till the end to think about certain things. Ruth, when do you suggest that say us, you know, so many people in here are solo business owners. They're here on their own, providing a lot of service-based businesses, you know, for somebody like that, who's setting up a business, when should they start thinking about estate planning? And All I'm right. imagining well, that's something they should keep reviewing. Yes, of course. We want to think about state planning at a very young age because it's the mindset that people all need to start expanding. We all just get in this procrastination mode. And I will tell you, people cannot make decisions. They get stuck, they freeze, they make terrible decisions. So I really believe that estate planning, just the mindset that goes along with what you're doing is so important to start even without owning a business, age 18. But then owning a business, all right, I'll cut you some slack. You wanna start off easy peasy. All right, let's go with at least a will. And we're gonna talk about if the business were to pass through your probate estate, meaning it's passing through your will, what do you want to do in particular in regard to your business? Is that going to a particular person? In other words, it's, it's a specific carve out in the will, or is it going in the rest residuary and remainder of your estate, meaning everything else that hasn't already been specifically given away? All right, so let's get past that. Then we're gonna talk about the appropriate executor to manage your estate. Now, above and beyond that, let's just pretend you thought that that business was going to continue on for a period of time. You may want to put the business interests into a testamentary trust. Again, if you're just going with a will. And then that trustee can continue on with everything in regard to the business for a long period of time. You have a viable business going on and perhaps you want some people to receive the income, the benefits, from the business, but you don't want them running the show. So let's just pretend you had um, parents and one owns a business and they have three kids. And let's just pretend you said, on my passing, my business interest goes in trust to be managed by this trustee and the benefits from the income coming from the business shall be distributed as follows. Maybe surviving spouse is one among the beneficiaries and the children are also beneficiaries, but I'm getting off here. The point of it is if you're going to start off basic and I'm cutting you some slack, you must have a will, okay? We got that and then we're gonna work on the terms and what we want out of it. Because remember, we don't know what's going on with the business. We don't know if it's viable, going to continue on, has some legs to it, or if it's one of those that really we just want to close up shop and be done with it, max out as much as we can with value, get, get the people their money and, and move on. But whatever it is, we've got to have the right people in charge and then determine what that looks like as far as people who are also benefiting from the business. Then we also have to have a power of attorney. We all know that, right? Power of attorney, power of attorney, power of attorney. We all know that. So do you have one? And if so, do you have a specific provision in your power of attorney about somebody handling business activities? And let's say, do we need to consider something more than that power of attorney as far as who's handling your business interests? Obviously, as you progress forward in your estate planning journey and you've learned to make baby decisions and you're moving forward and forward, hey, you may ultimately decide, I am now going to set up a lifetime trust. I'm starting a trust agreement. I'm transferring my business into interest into a trust. And that trustee named in the trust document will be able to manage my business interest in the event of my incapacity, even if it's for a short term or I have a long-term you know, hospital stay or car accident or whatever. And then upon my passing, 
the assets in the trust avoid probate, and I've also got the right person in charge. As far as estate planning techniques, there are incredible, fabulous, very fancy, complicated techniques that you could get into. But again, going back to basics, you must have a will in place. Obviously, you must have a power of attorney in place. And of course, everybody should also have their healthcare proxy living will in place. Now, of course, anybody who has a business interest, I'm saying, let me see your books. What's going on here? I want to be dumb. I want to look on paper and clearly understand by looking at what you presented to me that I can understand what is going on with your business. I can tell you pretty much anybody that I ask that question to, I don't know, where is the ledger that reflects properly who owns the corporate shares? Where are, where's the ledger that properly reflects the member interest? Does it match up with what has transpired in the board of directors minute meetings? Does it match up with what has transpired in um, whatever you've done from year to year on your tax returns? So my point of this is that there are basic documents above and beyond that with business interests. We've got to get into looking at the documents, seeing what is there and understanding if that alone needs a little bit of perk up or fix up as far as really being clear about what you have to the extent that literally as dumb as I want to be, I could look at what you have and understand what is going on and be up to date with it. I have estates where I, it's a disaster and I shake my head. What did you do? Oh, we, you know, we did the legal. I probably shouldn't say it. We did something online, you know, no understanding of what is going on, how things will be managed and um, people shouldn't do that to themselves. So going back to your question, be smart, get started early enough so your brain can get going with these types of matters. You cannot wait until you're ready to retire and then all of a sudden come up with the best options possible. And if you get there without troubles, you know, great. But I don't think that was, it didn't help you on your, your estate planning journey. And I'm sorry if I got quite off track there, which I could get really off track if I just- <laughs> You know, you're yeah. passionate about what you do and, and helping people, you you both are. So that that really comes through. Um, the, worst, the worst ones are family-owned businesses. Oh, I have because, one of those. <laughs> because we're all family and we all love each other. So I have I have a lot of um clients that's it's a partnership and it's just two people, like maybe they're friends or their colleagues or something. Yeah. Those people document everything because they recognize when you go into business with somebody, you're basically married to them and they want to account for every possible eventuality. So they're a lot easier to get on board with shareholder agreements and operating agreements and buy sell planning family owned businesses are terrible yeah. about doing this the and grandparents to to started the business and now the parents run it and the kids have worked there since they were 12 and everybody just sort of takes for granted that the kids are going to take it over someday but while we have three kids and really only one of them works in the business. And so that one thinks they should be entitled to more and there's nothing documented. We have no shareholder agreement. We have nothing. And I have a couple of clients right now. And that's, that's the case is I've got the kids, the adult kids who are essentially fighting over who gets the business, who has what number of shares. Cause that's not even necessarily clear. Or there was some sort of, you know, me and dad made a handshake agreement and then he died and there was no documentation of what the succession plan for the business was. Most people that are not operating a family business that are planning on passing a business to the next generation of non-family will take the time to document that. But most families take for granted that we don't need to write it down. Everyone's happy and we're all going to hold hands around the conference table and get along. And it's terrible. And so it's the it's the person who passes away who who didn't bother to plan and didn't bother to document that leaves just an epic disaster. I have so this I have one client right now where there's kind of two questions: Can we salvage the business relationship, and will these people ever have Thanksgiving together again? Like it's it's gotten that bad, and it all would have been avoided if. A generation ago when they started making their plan because they had a plan 
but they didn't reduce it to writing and they didn't make sure everybody was on the same page. And family businesses are very, very difficult to get them on board with doing that, you know, because everyone's concerned with fairness, but we typically have one sibling or two siblings that are really involved in the business and then one or two that aren't. That, that don't work there, they don't have anything to do with it, they don't want anything to do with it. And then, you know, Ruth knows as soon as someone dies, everyone who who survives them turns crazy and angry. And it's it's yeah. awful. And it's so sad to see a successful business that has really been a great thing for the family yeah. to just tear the family. Like they'd be better oh, just yeah. closing the doors and walking away and salvaging the family relationship. It's really, really sad to see that. Yeah. I want to squeeze in there. We're going back to my idea about mindset. I have situations where people haven't thought about these things, communicated these things, shoved them out of, under the rug. And a parent who's owned some type of business interest, I'm astounded because they're actually in trouble when it comes to applying for Medicaid. Or they may need Medicaid, and and we're going. Well, she doesn't own any. She doesn't own any part of the. She doesn't even get it. What do you mean? She's a shareholder in the business. You're yeah. not. You're not getting it. You know. So um, it's and unbelievable. That's, that's that's this again, though, because they're thinking about. She doesn't know. Oh, she doesn't have a house. She doesn't have a ton of money in the bank. And you're like, okay, but she still owns something. It goes back to mindset. People just can't make decisions. Can't deal with this. It's, you know, it should have been dealt with long ago. Um, and then as well, mindset between spouses, you know, you have a, one spouse running a business, the other spouse not knowing anything mm -hmm. about the business. And then there's some problems and, you know, it gets, I, I just keep bringing it back to this idea that people need to be much better prepared. I know we all procrastinate. I know it's just something to think about another day, but let's go back to our initial question about getting an attorney involved. Can you at least get an attorney involved to help you move things forward, progress you in your thoughts and be open to those thoughts so that, you know, this is, this is again, a golden opportunity, not something to leave and be frantic about and have a host of issues to deal with. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, and I feel like as, as you both are describing this and, and so often it's, it's not the person's fault either. It's not, you know, people don't know what they don't know which is why it is so important early on to get all of the advice that you possibly can from people like Alyssa, from people like Ruth, from the bankers, the insurance people, the accountants, all of these other people who are involved with a business. It's, it's, it is your responsibility as a business owner to find these things out and there are people and resources to help. So I, I really appreciate you both sharing so, so much help and value there. So I want to be respectful of your time. I'd, I'd like to wrap this up by asking you, what's the best way to contact each of you? Mine is always email. I always tell people the best time to call me is email. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Um, yeah, so I, I'm a big email person. I check my email pretty much 24-7 and sleep with my phone at night um, for email purposes, not for phone purposes. And my email is just a gross, A-G-R-O-S-S, -S, at Moran Lawyers, and that's lawyers, plural, dot com. It's M-O-R-A-N. And I'll be sure to put this information in the uh, in the comments and in the show notes for the podcast. So if anyone does uh, want to reach out, they absolutely should. And Ruth, for you, what is your preferred method of contact? I'm stealing that, Alyssa. That is the best. Uh, yes, email would be lovely. So it's ruth at ruthpgeorgelaw.com. All right. Yeah, people, I'm an introvert, which people don't believe. And you so are I not, need, Alyssa. I need time, <laughs> I need time to let things bake. <laughs> Like my husband won't call me without texting me first to tell me the topic of conversation because I need to like, no, I need to, I need to be prepared. So I prefer email. Maybe you're a prepared extrovert. That's all. No. <laughs> okay. oh. Well, thank you both. Thank you so much for joining me here. I feel like 
boy, between the two of you, you, I mean, you provided like a day's workshop worth of value here. I, I suggest people go back through this and re-listen and take some notes and pause because there was so much in there for business owners to think about. And I really, really appreciate you both being here sharing your advice. Thanks for having us. Awesome. Thanks for having us. My pleasure.